We're at a moment where we're literally between heaven and hell. We could create heaven on earth. We have technological capacity. We have resource, which is in many ways unimaginable. And at the very same time, the natural course of events is that the gates of hell are opening. It's not by accident that science fiction in the last 50 years has been fundamentally dystopian. Dystopian meaning disaster, the opposite of utopia. Whether it's Mad Max, whether it's Blade Runner, whether it's James Bond in which Dr. No wins. The, the images of hell abound because we're literally at a phase shift where our core structures are breaking down. Economic structures at their very core are breaking down. I mean, we have an exponential growth curve. Whenever you have an exponential growth curve, it always falls off. We went from half a billion people to seven, going at eight billion people, right? The resources of the planet that it took a billion years, right, to develop, we've used up, right, with no replacements. We have what my, my dear friend and colleague Daniel Schmachtenberger calls, right, an extraction model. An extraction model meaning we extract and extract and extract, but we don't put anything back in. We have a a linear materials economy in which we keep producing more and more and more waste. And that waste creates more and more dead zones, right? Fish in the seas barely exist, and the fish that do exist are toxic. We have peak phosphorus, and we have peak oil. We have rogue terrorist actors with more access to nuclear material and possibility than we ever had in history, right? Obviously, climate change, right, is a, a significant and serious factor, and Al Gore made his movie Inconvenient Truth, and it hasn't changed anything. At the same time, our mimetic structures are breaking down, meaning our structures of meaning. The postmodern world deconstructed all meaning, but didn't leave a story in its place. When modernity deconstructed premodernity, we had a new story, right? The great story of modernity and all of its values. When postmodernity comes and says the only grand narrative is that there's no grand narrative, well, then there's no story in its place. We're left without a story. Right? We have no story which equals our power. We have no story which meets our capacity, which meets our experience. So we're living in a world without an authentic narrative of meaning. We're living in a world without a universe story. We're living in a world in which dystopia in all of its many tragic forms literally breathes at the door. Now, if you think that's an overstatement, just take a look. What is the book that's actually captured the imagination, right, of the leading intelligentsia in the world in the last few years? Yuval Harari's book, First Homo Sapiens, and then Homo Deus. And essentially, Harari is painting a vision of dystopia. It's a dystopian world in which Homo Deus, the human being becomes God, but not actually God. The human being has the ability to biohack his way to immortality a kind of Hunger Games scenario in which an elite has access to the best technology, can do massive life extension, massive life power, right, bordering on immortality when the entire rest of humanity becomes irrelevant, in which data and algorithms replace the irreducible uniqueness of the individual, right, in which the human being being part of the data system, right, who's able to actually biohack and buy their way to this immense homo deus power becomes the ruling elite and the rest of humanity becomes ultimately irrelevant. And for Harari, that is the future. And for Harari, there is no story, there is no narrative, there are no deeper truths. Harari basically looks at a world in which pre-modern truths are dogmatic religious and need to be thrown out and he's partially right. And the only thing remaining afterwards is what he calls humanism, a kind of secular humanism, which is based on essentially subjective made up ideas. Well, that doesn't work, you know. Dostoevsky was not wrong when he said, without God, all is permitted. And when we say God, we don't mean the pre-modern God. Right? The God you don't believe in doesn't exist. We mean the God that's the intelligent, alive, living force of a creative cosmos. We have no new story. So homo deus, a dystopian Blade Runner Hunger Game vision of the world sold with its original first book, Homo Sapiens, eight million copies. And our friend Ridley Scott, blessings to you Ridley, just bought the movie rights, and this is the story. 
And the reason people are reading the story so avidly is because people are desperate for a narrative. And the book's great. It's, it's witty, it's, it's urbane, it's funny. It brings together an enormous amount of facts, but it's fundamentally telling a misguided story because Harari has no sense of interiors, right? Has no sense of, of actually spirit being real, right? He has no sense of a larger story, which is the story of the evolution of love. He has no sense of not a new Darwinian survival of the fittest story. That's the one he buys into. But there's actually a much better story that Darwin himself knew. Darwin talks about love 95 times in his descent and about natural selection twice. Right? There's actually a new story. And this new story emerges from the best scientists we have today. And it merges and reflects also the deepest structures of the great traditions. It's not homo deus. It's not a dystopian, biohacked, elite, hunger games homo deus. It's homo amor. Homo amor. Homo amor, the human being who incarnates uniquely the love intelligence of reality. But that's not a made up idea. It's not a, a poetic idea, although it has enormous poetic power. It's actually the prose of reality itself. And what we're here to do is to actually unpack the emergence of Homo amor. And who is Homo amor? Homo amor is an expression of what we're calling the intimate universe. And the first principle is, the first tenet of reality is, we live in an intimate universe. Intimacy, we've exiled to the human realm. And when we say intimate relations, we mean a particular dimension of the human realm, right? Sexuality. Blessings to sexuality, right? And blessings to human intimacy. But intimacy is not particularly and only human. Human intimacy is an expression of a larger field of intimacy. Reality is intimate. Right? We live in an, an intimate universe. Reality right, is birthed into being right, by the desire of no thing to manifest. The infinite, infinity loves finitude. The unmanifest wants to manifest. And at the very first moment of manifestation, intimacy is the structure of cosmos. In the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang, quarks. Is it strings? Is it quarks? We're not quite sure. But let's say quarks. Quarks come together. Quarks, three quarks live together. Howard Bloom, right, the great writer on science, points out that if three quarks aren't together, they disappear. They're gone. They don't exist. Quarks are drawn together by a desire to be intimate. They're drawn together by what frontier science is calling allurement. At the very core, the very essence of cosmos is an allurement towards intimacy. The universe feels, and the universe feels its way towards deeper intimacies. So you have quarks coming together, and when they come together, they ultimately form subatomic particles. What are subatomic particles? Protons, neutrons, electrons, which are fields of allurement. There's not a thing. We now realize, if we go into the depths of science, that there's no actual thing there. There's the search for the thing. It's not quite there. It's a field of intimacy. It's a field of allurement. Right? The basic structure of reality is fields of intimacy. Right? Reality is moved by allurement. And then those subatomic particles, right, drawn by what Whitehead called the lure of feeling, right, come together and they form atoms at the very heart of matter. The very heart of the matter is heart. And heart is allurement. It's intimacy. Atoms are structures of intimacy drawn together. Subatomic particles come together and create a new identity. And that new identity is atoms. Because what intimacy is, is shared identity. Intimacy is shared identity. The proton and the neutron each give something up in order to form a larger identity. Because that's how intimacy operates. I give something up to form a deeper we, right? a deeper identity, a larger field together. So we begin to realize we live in an intimate universe. And intimacy is creative. And then those atoms come together. And those atoms form molecules. Well, what's making them form molecules? What's driving this? So we have a name for it in science. We call it electromagnetic attraction. But what's underneath electromagnetic attraction? What is electromagnetic attraction? In the celestial realm, right, we call it gravity. But what's underneath gravity? Nothing. 
There's nothing underneath gravity. There's nothing underneath electromagnetic attraction. Those are but two descriptors in the science, two words for allurement. The feeling that I want to be intimate with you. I want to come closer, right? I want to create a field together with you in which we have shared identity. Right? Intimacy is shared identity in the context of otherness. The subatomic particles don't disappear in the atom. The atom doesn't disappear in the molecule. Then the molecules come together and they create complex molecules. And then those complex molecules, they deepen their intimacy. And at some point, their intimacy is so intensified that intensification of intimacy births life, cells. And, and that's what drives all of reality. All of reality has this strange, mysterious quality, magic. The magic of science is the fairy dust of science, if you will, is emergence. What's emergence? Emergence means that out of a group of parts allured together to create a new identity, because intimacy is shared identity, a new identity. Right? The molecules come together, they form a complex molecule. The complex molecule right, deepens its intensified relationship, comes together right, with other molecules, and all of a sudden, voila, you have a cell, right? a new identity. But that cell, that cell respirates, it breathes. That cell replicates, none of its parts do. None of the, the cytoplasm, right, the membrane, none of the parts, the organelles, none of the parts of the cell respirate. None of the molecules in the cell breathe, but the cell does. So that's what it means. It means these separate parts come together, they form a larger intimacy, and intimacy is creative. It births something, a possibility that never existed before. Wow, that's just, it's just kind of shocking. Right? You've got hydrogen and oxygen, neither at room temperature or liquid, and yet they come together and you have water. That's emergence, it's a new property. It didn't exist before. So at this moment, we're faced with crisis. It's a crisis of unimaginable proportions. But crisis is, as my dear friend Barbara Marx Hubbard loves to say, and correctly, crisis is a birth. Crisis is an evolutionary driver. Right? The nature of reality is that a crisis in intimacy births a new level, a higher form of intimacy. Emergency creates emergence. So on the one hand, we're before the gates of hell. On the other hand, there's a possibility of creating a heaven on earth, the likes of which we, we could have never dreamed of in our wildest dreams. Let's just capture this for a second. Crisis and intimacy, single-celled organisms. They can't breathe because they're getting poisoned by the oxygen in the atmosphere and there's this huge population explosion of single-celled organisms suffocating because they don't have resource suffocating from the atmosphere itself. Sound familiar? And so what do they do? There's this crisis, right? Death, right? The gates of hell are open. So they learn how to create new structures of intimacy. And prokaryotic cells, single-celled organisms poisoned by oxygen, right? Come through a process of photosynthesis through the chlorophyll molecule itself emerging from the unique intimacy between the earth and the sun and the moon, and they create multicellular organisms that are able, multicellular, new structure of intimacy that's no longer poisoned by the oxygen, that breathes the oxygen. That's shocking. There's a crisis in intimacy, single-celled organisms overpopulating, poisoned by the environment, and that crisis is birth. So we're before precisely such a moment. And at such a moment, what we need to do is, and there's the only thing we can do, we've got to do exactly what da Vinci did. Da Vinci, he's in Florence, right? He's faced with the tragedy of the Black Death, right? The immense horror, right, of the medieval period, right? The, the complete degradation, right, of the human being dying in numbers that are unimaginable, right, in, in writhing pain. And da Vinci can't go to every village in Europe and and solve it, right? He's standing literally before the gates of darkness and he realizes there's one thing I can do. Da Vinci and all of his colleagues in the Renaissance, they say, we gotta tell a new story. We gotta tell a better story. We gotta tell a story that is more accurate, 
right, whose prose, right, emerges from the deepest sciences, right, the deepest sciences that begin to tell a new story of the human being, a new vision of humanity, a new human, a new humanity emerges from da Vinci's story, and that's the move from pre-modernity, the traditional period, to modernity, science, human rights, feminism, right, progress, right, everything that we know that birthed liberal culture and humanism is born by telling a new story, the best story that could be possibly told from the best sciences of the time. But modernity brought us right, all of that power, right, all of that technological unfurling right, of, of power beyond imagination, brought us to over extracting, right, to depleting right, the life resources of the planet. Right, to creating technologies that can destroy the planet, to a bomb right, that exploded in 1945 when we realized we don't have a story equal to our power. So what do we do? So we have to tell a new story. And we have the ability again, just like da Vinci, to tell a new story based on the best sciences, but not just the exterior sciences, right? not just the best of quantum physics, the best of molecular biology, right? the best of anthropology, the best of the 11 schools of psychology merged and integrated into the most seamless, gorgeous Renaissance vision, but also the interior sciences. Because the great traditions, they got a lot wrong. Their surface structures were often ethnocentric, homophobic, anti-body, right? and, and profoundly degrading of the human being. But their depth structures, their interior structures shared by all the great traditions told us something about the nature of reality, told us something important in Christendom, in Islam, in Judaism, in Tibetan Buddhism, in Confucianism, in, in Taoism, in Mayan, in Vajrayana, in Kashmir Shaivism, in their depth structures had a deep and profound interior understanding. We've got to bring that together now with the best of exterior sciences, meaning the intimate universe disclosed in science, disclosed in molecular biology, disclosed in quantum physics, and in which the exterior mirrors the interior, and we begin to realize, oh my God, we live in an intimate universe. One, two, intimacy is creative. Three, intimacy creates new possibility, right? Four, the drive to intimacy isn't in order to survive. We're willing to give up survival in order to get intimacy, 